Hello, and welcome to the PEER Program's Economic Revitalization Program Overview. After completing this module, you should understand the Economic Revitalization Program background and program design, learn how to apply for an economic revitalization project, be able to identify eligible economic revitalization activities and applicants, and understand where to find program resources. Currently in the program, we have allocated funds to eligible counties and will begin to evaluate and select projects as they are submitted, followed by awarding subrecipients, and then subrecipients will then implement their projects. These funds are a part of a $422 million CDBG disaster recovery effort in response to the 2020 Labor Day fires and will be administered by OHCS. In addition to the peer program, the funds will also be used for homeowner and renter assistance, among other programs. The effort called Reorgan will rebuild and create new housing, infrastructure, assist with economic revitalization, and assist communities impacted by the fires. You can review the full action plan on the Reorgan website linked in this deck. The action plan describes how the state will spend the allocation to support recovery in eight impacted counties. As part of this action plan, Oregon has defined the peer program, which will provide $42 million for planning, economic revitalization, and infrastructure projects. Economic revitalization activities promote economic recovery, improve long-term economic resilience, and addresses the needs of vulnerable populations. Disaster recovery economic revitalization activities respond to urgent needs that attract, retain, and restore the local economy. Under the peer program, economic revitalization funds will be awarded to nonprofit organizations that will set up with OHCS approved programs for businesses to apply to. These organizations will be responsible for developing and promoting their program, as well as implementing the program from application to closeout. Peer projects must meet certain requirements. Projects must be timely and follow a clear schedule that shows project completion before February 2028. Each project must have a minimum budget of $500,000. Each project must tie di directly back to recovery from the disaster event or mitigate against future risk and each project must be eligible under CDBG DR requirements. Eligible counties have been allocated projects to create projects under the peer program. As you can see listed here in this slide, these counties each have created selection committees to select projects to bring to OHCS for approval. If you would like to apply to PEER and you are in Lane, Jackson, Douglas, or Klamath County, you should visit their websites linked in the slide deck. These websites will describe those counties' local processes of application. To learn more about Lincoln, Lynn, and Marion, or if you are unsure who to reach out to or have questions, you can reach out to peer at hcs.oregon.gov to request assistance. Who will be reviewing your project? Selection committees are made of voting members from organizations 
that directly support underserved community, communities, local government, economic district representatives, long-term recovery groups, tribes, or other organizations that have a vested interest in the county's recovery. These committees will receive and review your project, then vote to decide to move the project before OHCS to review. You may be wondering, who can apply for these funds? That includes tribes, state agencies, counties, municipal governments, districts, authorities, and any other public or quasi-public entity, such as a council of government, can apply for these funds. As a part of the application process, a project description form will be required by OHCS. There is a separate form for each type of project eligible under PEER. That's planning, economic revitalization, and infrastructure. This slide deck has a link to each form. Please note that the form will require detailed information about the project, such as the budget and how the project meets the required eligibility criteria. While some selection committees may allow an approved alternative document during selection, this form will be required by OHCS when submitting the project to the state. Typical types of economic revitalization activities include grants and loans to businesses, job training and placement programs, commercial improvements, initiatives to attract or retain employees, and technical assistance to businesses and microenterprises. The goals of economic revitalization programs include addressing gaps in the job in the economy by creating jobs, expanding or rebuilding businesses in communities, and creating or improving critical infrastructure to attract more businesses. CDBG DRA funds require a tieback to the disaster event, meaning each business must demonstrate how their business was impacted by the fires. That impact could be physical damage or fiscal losses. This tieback requirement must be included in your program guidelines and documented when reviewing applications. One exception to meeting the tieback requirement for a business not directly impacted by the fires is that the business is relocating or providing a service to an impacted community. Again, typical types of economic revitalization activities include grants and loans to businesses, job training and placement programs, commercial improvements, initiatives to attract or retain technical assistance, and businesses to technical assistance and businesses and microenterprises. Let's see what each type entails. Assistance to businesses include grants, loans, and forgivable loans to for-profit businesses to use for working capital, construction, acquisition, or other business expenses. Examples of business assistance includes providing loans for facade improvements or maybe to assist an impacted restaurant to purchase equipment that was destroyed. Microenterprises are defined as businesses with five or fewer employees. These type of businesses can receive grants, loans, or technical assistance. An example of microenterprise assistance is providing technical assistance to a startup business that will be located in an impacted community to launch or market their business. Another example is providing a grant to hire or retain employees. 
Next, we have commercial rehabilitation by public or private nonprofit entities where businesses are provided assistance that will typically result in job creation or services that benefit an identified area. Under this activity, working capital or operating costs are not eligible expenses. Examples of commercial rehabilitation include rehabilitation for code violation or assistance to a nonprofit for rehabilitation of their building that provides shelter to individuals experiencing homelessness. Public facilities and improvements award funding to public entities to construct or improve public infrastructure to benefit one or more commercial businesses and create employment or economic opportunities. Benefiting businesses must formally agree to meet the national objective like job creation or retention. An example of this includes expanding or repairing a sidewalk in an underserved commercial district, or it can include installing sewage and water on undeveloped land for new businesses to open in an area that serves low to moderate income residents. Economic development undertaken by nonprofit development organizations. Under this activity, Funding is provided to community-based organizations or community development financial institutions to carry out economic development programs. An example of a program under this activity is a CBDO or CDFI creates a small business loan program that awards funds to businesses in their service area. Under this program, a revolving loan fund is established that will continue to fund other businesses as loans are repaid. Technical assistance provides training or assistance to businesses to expand their expertise or support economic development activity implementation. Program examples include a training series to increase business capacity to carry out microenterprising programming or technical assistance to nonprofits to ensure management of the economic development program is CDBG compliant. There are activities that are ineligible under the peer program. These include assisting privately owned businesses serving predominantly higher income households assistance to business owners that have unresolved tax obligations or delinquencies, or they may have unresolved findings with previous CDBG programming. It also includes assistance to businesses that are not actively registered to SAM.gov and have a unique entity identifier. Activities that do not meet a national objective or have a tie back to the disaster. Things that would be considered planning for economic development projects, such as market surveys or commercial plans, and any other additional ineligible activities can be found in the, that can be found in the peer program policy. Each eligible project must also meet a national objective to be eligible for CDBG DR funding. The national objective relates to the beneficiaries of the project. The types of national objectives include low and moderate income area benefit, low and moderate income limited clientele, low and moderate income jobs, and urgent needs. Low and moderate income area benefit or LMA for economic revitalization provides services or goods to a specific area. The area served by the business must be a predominantly low and moderate income population where at least 51% of the population or LMI and the area must be primarily residential. 
To document LMA, a business will provide the geographic boundary of their service area with census low and moderate income service data, su summary data, or income survey data that demonstrates at least 51% of the area is LMI and that the business provides goods or services to all residents in the area. Examples of business types using the LMA national objective would be a grocery store, pharmacy, or businesses providing medical services. The LMI limited clientele national objective can be used when activities are providing a service directly to support LMI individuals, such as job training or microenterprise assistance when the business owner is LMI. To document LMC for a microenterprise, Business owner or individuals receiving job training, placement, or support services requires income verification and confirmation that the individuals live within the eligible counties served by the program. Under a training or support services program, at least 51% of the individuals must be LMI. Under the LMI Jobs National Objective, at least 51% of the jobs created or retained by the business after assistance is provided must be made or available to LMI individuals. To document LMI jobs, income verification of the employees hired or retained is required and at least 51% of those individuals must be LMI. Only permanent jobs are counted and part-time jobs can be converted to full-time equivalent positions. An example of LMI job creation is assisting a business that hires an unqualified LMI individual and provides on-the-job training where you pro would provide evidence of outreach efforts to advertise for that job, provide the income verification pre and post hire. An example of LMI job retention is assisting a business that notified staff that they are eliminating their job, but the assistance from the peer program allows the business to retain these positions. Here, you will provide proof that the job would be eliminated without the peer program assistance. You will also provide income verification showing at least 51% of the jobs retained or LMI and proof that the position was retained at the end of the business's grant period. The urgent need national objective is approved on a limited basis. To document urgent need, subrecipients must describe the specific need, explain what urgency the project addresses, describe how existing conditions pose a serious and immediate threat to the health and welfare of the community, and describe how, project, how the project responds to the urgency, type, scale, and location described in the Reorgan Action Plan. An example of using the urgent need national objective would be when an area experienced an earthquake or fire and needs help um, and needs to help local businesses recover or repair damages in order to provide goods or services to the impacted area. All details to address the urgent need national objective should be documented. CDBG DR assisted economic revitalization projects must undergo underwriting to ensure businesses are financially viable and will effectively use CDBG DR funding. To establish viability, each project or business must be reviewed to ensure the following. That project costs are reasonable. That all sources of fund pro project financing are committed. 
that to the extent practicable, CDBG DRR funds are not substituted for non-federal financial support, that the project is financially feasible, that the return on the owner's equity investment will not be unreasonably high, and CDBG DRR funds are dispersed on a pro rata basis with other finances provided to the project. Subrecipients should establish how these requirements will be determined in their programming. Subrecipients must follow HUD's underwriting guidance when awarding special economic development activities, which includes most activities assisting for profit businesses eligible under the peer program. All, project, all projects must be reviewed for duplication of benefits. A DOB occurs when an entity or individual receives assistance for the same purpose or need from multiple sources. CDBG DR is a supplement to insurance and other forms of disaster assistance. You must have a DOB policy and procedure that prevents DOB ensure D CDBG DR awards are necessary and reasonable, and continually monitor for compliance and recapture funds if a DOB occurs. Sources of duplicative assistance includes, but are not limited to, private insurance, FEMA funds, SBA funds, NFIP, local and state funds, other federal programs, or private and nonprofit organization funding. Examples of non-duplicative sources are private or bank loans, other assets or lines of credit, funds received for a different eligible program purpose, or any other funding sources specifically identified in the applicable Federal Register Notice. To prevent DOB, as mentioned, subrecipients must develop DOB policies and procedures, include a section in the application that lists other duplicative sources and amounts, ensure DOB requirements are in the agreements, ensure program staff are trained and understand DOB requirements, and connect with other subrecipients administering funds that may be duplicative and create a method to cross-reference beneficiaries. So what's next for you? Once you submit a project to OHCS, and if the project is selected, OHCS will begin the contracting process, followed by a kickoff meeting once the agreement is executed. The purpose of the kickoff meeting is to review the contract expectations and reporting requirements. Subrecipients will be required to attend all preliminary training and technical assistance sessions and will be required to sign a certification confirming attendance. Subrecipients will then create all program policies and materials and an outreach plan that must be reviewed and approved by OHCS prior to program implementation. Once OHCS approves, the subrecipient may launch their program, conducting outreach, and then begin to accept applications. All applications must be reviewed thoroughly to verify requirements are met and all to documentation has been provided. Once an application is approved and goes through the underwriting process, the subrecipient will meet with the business to sign a legally binding agreement, review regulatory and reporting requirements. Once all required documents are executed, subrecipients can disperse assistance to the business depending on the eligible activity type the business's project falls under. During project implementation or the life of the agreement with the business recipient, the subrecipient 
will meet and stay in contact with the business to collect required data and documentation. Subrecipients should monitor businesses to be prepared for OHCS monitoring visits that will occur during and or after the contract term with OHCS. Subrecipients are required to submit monthly reports and request reimbursements to OHCS. This flowchart depicts the process as described in the previous slides. Okay, now let's test your knowledge of what we covered in this training. True or false, individual for-profit businesses can apply directly to the selection committees for assistance. False, eligible entities must apply to the selection committee to set up economic revitalization programs. Once funded, those entities will work with OHCS to create application materials for individual for-profit businesses. Next question. Economic revitalization assistance can take the form of grants, loans, forgivable loans, or all of the above. The answer is D, all of the above. That concludes this training session. For any questions you may have, please send an email using the contact information provided on this slide. Thank you and have a great day.